Alors, oui. Et ses commentaires euh, sur euh, Hitler. M. Trudeau, tout à l'heure, a dit que c'était euh, inconcevable. Vous, est-ce que vous pensez que M. Lavrov devrait s'excuser? C'est clair qu doit, que Lavrov devrait s'excuser. Non seulement Sergei Lavrov devrait s'excuser, mais ce qu'il a dit était complètement odieux, déplorable et empreint d'antisémitisme. Pourquoi? Parce que dans sa façon d'aborder la question, ce qu'il dit essentiellement, c'est comme s'il prenait les victimes de l'Holocauste et il les transforme en bourreaux. Alors qu'on sait très bien ce qui s'est passé lors de l'Holocauste, on sait qu'il y a eu un génocide et, bien entendu, on doit se rappeler pour jamais répéter ce qui s'est passé lors de l'Holocauste. Comme je vois, si je me trompe, il me semble que M. Lavrov, à un certain moment donné, il était, disons ça comme ça, parlable. Qu'est-ce qui a changé depuis l'invasion de Bien, écoutez, clairement, il y a une grande campagne de désinformation qui a lieu présentement euh, en Ukraine, mais aussi partout à travers le monde, menée par la Russie, euh, parce qu'ils essaient, en fait, de justifier l'injustifiable. Et c'est comme ça qu'ils... Euh, la campagne de désinformation de la Russie, elle est basée sur le fait qu'il y a des mensonges par rapport à la nécessité d'intervenir en Ukraine, notamment pour, en guillemets, « dénazifier » le pays, alors qu'on sait très bien que le président ukrainien lui-même est juif. C'est le chef de la démocratie? Euh, C'est le chef de la diplomatie? Oui, russe? certainement pas de la démocratie. Non, non est-ce que c'est le temps de… de, de, de mais ben écoutez, on a déjà sanctionné Lavrov, on a déjà sanctionné Poutine. Nous, ce qu'on a toujours dit, c'est que c'est important qu'on puisse avoir une ambassade en Russie. Pourquoi? Parce que le Canada doit avoir ses yeux et ses oreilles sur le terrain en Russie, comme le font tous les autres pays du G7. Et donc, c'est important, puisqu'il y a toujours un principe de réciprocité, lorsque vient la question des ambassades, qu'on puisse avoir une présence là-bas, avec la quelques dizaines de diplomates qui sont présents à notre ambassade. Vous êtes allé en Ukraine avant oui. euh, le conflit, pas depuis le conflit. Personne du Canada est allé depuis le conflit. Pourquoi est-ce qu'on peut s'attendre à un voyage bien? Bien, premièrement, oui, je suis allée en Ukraine. Ma collègue de la Défense également est allée en Ukraine. Et c'est sûr que dans un avenir, euh, euh, nous irons. Dans l'avenir, nous irons en Ukraine un jour et je ne dirai pas plus de détails sur la question. Pourquoi? Parce qu'il y a des questions de sécurité et c'est nécessaire de faire en sorte, justement, de protéger ce, ce, toute forme de déplacement là-bas. Merci. A lot of ticked off travelers in Vancouver, Toronto, long, long lineups. What do you say to them? First of all, I say that I uh, share their concern. I've been hearing about this. I'm a traveler myself, uh, and I've seen lineups grow over the last few weeks. Uh, and I have been working, and Transport Canada has been working with CATSA on ensuring that we have the adequate resources uh, to respond to this surge of, uh, of need for travelers. Uh, we're seeing this, I guess, at a variety of, uh, of venues and, uh, and, and Passport Canada. So we're seeing that there's a lot of appetite for people to travel quickly and CATSA and other uh, agencies need to respond adequately to this uh, surge. So we're working on it, but I just want to ask Canadians, first, I want to appreciate their patience. And, and, and I know it's been like this for the last two years of different uh, uncertain Uh, measures and, and, and waiting, um, but we're, at, we're acting, we're working on it, and uh, hopefully we'll see an adjustment to the resources as quickly as possible. But what does that really mean? Because the timelines we're hearing from at least one of the airports is like, or perhaps it was the unions, but like we're still talking about potentially weeks of this. Do you think that's realistic? I think, I think it, I, I, I cannot, you know, I don't think that we're going to immediately be able to resolve this. We're directing the resources as quickly as we can. It's going to take some time to ramp up. So I think it's reasonable to assume a few weeks for us to get all the resources necessary. But I'm hoping to start seeing relief as quickly as possible. Uh, it may take us full, a few weeks to get all the resources needed, but we are ramping up. CATSA is ramping up as quickly as possible, and we're going to see some relief offered in the coming days. Uh, but it'll probably take us a few weeks to get all the resources that we need. The CATSA Employees Union is telling us that people are not being trained adequately and that they're in negotiations and that there's not an offer to bump up the salary. They're basically saying, listen, penny pinching is part of the problem here. What do you say to that? Look, CATSA is an independent crown corporation, and I'm going to leave the operations of employees' relations to uh, CATSA. Uh, so I'm not going to comment on their internal operations. I support CATSA workers or aviation workers to get 
uh, uh, for the work that they've done, over, particularly over the last two years. I know there are challenges, and I'm, uh, I want to make sure that CATSA is working diligently on responding to the needs that the industry and the workers have. But then, can I get you to diagnose the problem? And if you, if you want to say, like, listen, they've got to do their own thing, what is this about? It's just, it's just about uh, people power? What's going on? Oh, you mean the, the lineups? Uh, yes. Uh, so I, I think we're seeing this everywhere in the economy. We're, now we're learning that when, once you turn off the economy, when you turn it back on, it comes back with imbalances in it. And we're seeing it, especially in the travel sector, from complete almost 90% reduction mm -hmm. to now massive appetite, resurgence of appetite. We're seeing lineup for Passport Canada. We're seeing lineups at, uh, at, uh, at CBSA. So this is a similar symptom to what the phenomenon that we're uh, witnessing. We need to respond adequately and quickly to it. We're working on it. Last question is just what you pointed to. Passports, this. There are folks who are going to say the government didn't have its ducks in a row. You had to know that there was going to be a big surge in demand, and now travelers are experiencing all these hardships. Don't you want the tourism sector to, to flourish? What, what, what didn't you do? I do. I do want the tourism sector to flourish. And we were there supporting them from the beginning, and we will continue to support them. Look, this is not a government issue. This is an economy sector-wide issue. Uh, we're seeing it uh, in supply chains. We're seeing it in the private sector. We're seeing it everywhere. The imbalance in the economy that we're witnessing is happening everywhere. Uh, having said that, we need to respond and react as quickly as we can, and we are working on it. So, yes, we are seeing different sectors of the economy experience this resurgence of demand. Uh, and, and we're working on, with our stakeholders, with our partners to respond adequately. Okay. Anything you want to add on the topic, Minister? Just want to say, look, Canadians, I know, uh, I know, uh, you know, it's, I know it's been frustrating. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the travel measures that we had in place over the last two years to protect their health and safety has reduced travel. Now people are understandably want to travel again. I ask that maybe they arrive early to the airport until the, we return to the balance that we're, we need to get to. For now, I ask and thank people for their patience and, and that we, to let them know that we're working on it as quickly as possible. Is there a certain level of transmission or a certain level of cases that we're waiting to go under the threshold before we leave the mask mandate? What, what's the oh, threshold? Okay, so we were talking about something else. Uh, I know, I'm yes. sorry, I'm jumping uh, in on a different topic. Uh, look, there are quantitative measures and there are qualitative measures. So sure. it's not just pure numbers that we look for. We look at also risk and risk tolerance, uh, about the uh, circumstantial situation, the, co uh, the COVID transmission, the hospitalization rate. So it's not just the numbers, right. but it's also risk and risk associated with it. So uh, when the number starts coming down in the spring, we are most likely, so, you, you, so you say you revise thing, that every two weeks, right? The first thing we're looking at currently is the vaccine mandate, uh, the ma mask mandate is also looked at, but I, I in my opinion, is the least uh, cumbersome uh, a measure that infringes, on, infringes the least on passengers. However, it offers a meaningful layer of protection. So for us, uh, the most immediate consideration is the vaccine mandate and the mask mandate will be also looked at, but it's not as, as, as an immediate priority than the vaccine mandate. And on the vaccine mandate, do you have a timeline? Uh, look, uh, it's being studied right now. We've been looking at the research data that has been available. I'm hoping, uh, like, I, I don't know, we're, we're going to review it in the coming weeks. Uh, now, what the decision of the review is going to be, I still can't tell you because I, don't, I can't predict it, but it's going to be reviewed in the coming weeks. Merci. Okay, thank you. Merci. Minister, the, the weeks thing is going to be headlines, right? Like this is going to go on for weeks. So I just want to give you an opportunity. Is there anything else you want to say about this? Like the idea that this could go on for weeks? The witch. You oh, the cats are. Cats are. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> because I mean, that's, just... that's the headline out of yeah. this, uh, if I'm being frank. No, 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 no. I said two things to you. Yeah. I said weeks to get back to full uh, level of service that is needed. Yeah. But the, in, uh, the infusion of resources is happening immediately. Now, are we going to see elimination of lineups immediately? I'll be honest with you. I don't think so. It's not, it's not going to be uh, a magic wand or a silver bullet. It's going to be ramping up the resources. So you're going to see relief being offered immediately. It's going to take a few weeks for us to completely balance off everything. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Well, I'm here to express my concern over Government Motion 11. Um, if the motion passes the way that Justin Trudeau and the NDP uh, want it to, 
It effectively does uh, a few things that are concerning. Number one is it gives the government the power to, within the last minute of a daily session, to extend the session uh, to midnight. That obviously has an impact and a profound impact on the people that work here. Uh, it uh, certainly, from our standpoint, uh, puts the opposition on its heels where the expectation is that we're going to uh, be uh, debating uh, on our own, effectively, because another part of this is the constitutional requirement of a quorum call not being allowed. Um, which means that the government and the NDP and their partners in the NDP could, affect, could be sitting at home uh, while Conservatives in the Bloc are in the House debating government pieces of legislation. Uh, so that's quite concerning as well. Uh, the other parts of this is the fact that uh, uh, the quorum call, other things like dilatory motions. Uh, there's also concerns as well, uh, and I was very pleased today to see the Speaker carve out certain sections of what is effectively uh, an omnibus uh, procedural motion where he took a couple of things out. I'm grateful for that so that we can vote on those, but uh, the government, for example, put the Truth and Reconciliation Day, uh, the acknowledgement of that, uh, into this procedural motion when it should have been dealt with uh, in any standing order debate. So what they tried to do was to put this poison pill in to get the government to vote against it. Look, what the NDP has done by agreeing to this with the Liberals is given ex Justin Trudeau exactly what he's wanted for the last six and a half years. He's now got an audience and not an opposition. It's not the government's job to simply, and it's not the, the role of parliament or the opposition to simply turn this into a rubber stamp factory for multi-billions of dollars of government legislation. Our job is to scrutinize, our job is to hold the government to account, to make sure that uh, it's transparent and accountable to Canadians, and this is effectively taking those abil that ability away from, um, from opposition parties. The resources on committees. Committee is doing very important work in several areas. Number one is on the Emergency Act invocation. The Emergency Committee is looking into that. Uh, the medical assistance in dying. We already heard today that the government is now cancelling two committees today. The Afghan Committee, which is designed to look into the government's actions uh, as it relates to the fall of Afghanistan. Uh, they're going to take those resources of what should be important work of the committees and now turn it into evening sessions of Parliament. The standing orders are clear, and just last year we all agreed, all the government House leaders agreed to the, to, to the dates that debates will happen. We have the ability to extend those hours at the end of June, which typically happens. And so by doing this at the beginning of May, uh, you know, it's going to take a lot of resources away from those important committees. And lastly, the thing that is really concerning uh, is the ability of one Minister of the Crown to rise in Parliament and shut this place down whenever they want to. They could, they could, they could come in here if scandals are brewing, if, for example, the RCMP starts investigating the Prime Minister over his actions to, uh, to the, uh, the island vacation that he took, or other things like We Charity or SNC-Lavalin, any other scandals, or even the invocation of the Emergency Act, the Prime Minister can single-handedly shut this place down to prorogue Parliament without proroguing. And he can do that at any point. And he can do that at any point. So that is concerning. Among all of the things that are concerning within this procedural motion, uh, that is concerning to us. Peut-être que je vais inviter M. Berthaud pour, euh, pour répondre à, à sa question. M. Berthaud? Bien, il y en a pour des événements précis, pour des projets de loi précis. Et en ce moment, ce qu'on a, c'est un baillon sur absol absolument tout les projets de législation du gouvernement libéral, avec l'appui du NPD. Oui, mais sauf qu'à un moment donné, l'opposition a des recours, a des outils habituellement qu'elle peut utiliser pour faire savoir son mécontentement, pour tenir le gouvernement responsable de ses actes. Et en ce moment, ce que le gouvernement libéral est en train de faire, c'est de nous priver de tous ces outils-là avec la collaboration du NPD. Euh, le gouvernement ne se force même pas à répondre, il ne se forcera même pas 
à être là, à être présent lorsqu'il va y avoir des débats, en n'obligeant plus le quorum ici dans cette Chambre-là, en permettant au ministre de déclarer qu'on va siéger jusqu'à minuit à tous les soirs, sans tenir compte des ressources humaines financières de la Chambre des communes. Et surtout, le gouvernement, si jamais il est pris dans un autre scandale comme celui de la GRC actuellement, puis la, la, la possibilité qu'il y a eu des accusations de fraude qui auraient pu être déposées contre Justin Trudeau, bien, le gouvernement se donne le droit de proroger la session jusqu'en septembre sur un simple avis d'un ministre. C'est totalement inacceptable. On n'a jamais vu ça. Et le pire dans tout ça, c'est que ça se fait avec la complicité du NPD. Le NPD qui s'est battu pendant des années contre les baillons euh, de tous les gouvernements, que ce soit les gouvernements conservateurs, que ce soit les gouvernements libéraux. Et là, le NPD appuie ça. Puis on a vu aujourd'hui l'absurdité totale. On a un baillon sur le baillon permanent que le gouvernement va imposer à la Chambre. Donc, ça démontre le peu de respect qu'a Justin Trudeau pour le fonctionnement de cette Chambre-là. Et euh, il a finalement, en achetant le NPD, il s'est acheté aussi des spectateurs qui sont là pour applaudir, pas pour faire avancer la législation. Là-dessus, je dois y aller parce qu'il faut absolument que j'aille pour la période de questions. So, just uh, one more thing I want to add. You know, the NDP, for the last uh, six and a half years, has been consistent in their criticism of the government. Uh, in fact, I said, just said in the House that uh, the NDP, uh, many times, the House Leader, uh, Mr. Julian, has said that uh, he's criticized uh, the Prime Minister for the amount of times that he's invoked closure and notice of time allocation, and yet they're now complicit and you know, agreeing with the government on this. So the hypocrisy on the part of the NDP is palpable on this. We're proposing reasonable amendments. We have proposed reasonable amendments, and I'm hopeful that the NDP will agree with it, but I suspect they won't because the government's got them in their hip pocket right now. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup.